Uh, my name is Joanne Hutton, and uh, I act as a co-chair for the Plant Nova Natives Initiative, which is one of the three uh, sponsoring um, entities for this event, and would like to tell you a little bit uh, about Plant Nova Natives as we get started. Uh, I myself am a member of the Episcopal branch of God's Faith, uh, a member of St. John's Lafayette Square downtown, which has been rather much in the news lately, rather too much in the news lately. But um, that is um, the background for my participation and interest in this particular uh, subject matter, I chair the creation care group at, in our congregation and uh, have been active with the Plant Nova Natives uh, campaign for uh, over five years. So uh, just to give those of you who are not familiar, many of you are uh, very likely more or less members of the Plant Nova Natives community. Uh, but everyone may not be. So I thought I would just give a little bit of background in that uh, many people are unaware that we are not a 501c3. We are merely a campaign uh, composed of partnerships, a very rich uh, series of partnerships. Over 100 different groups uh, participate and cooperate in, in helping us drive towards our goal. The objective of the campaign, which initially received federal monies, but no longer does, uh, was to create a social marketing campaign to educate the public about the importance of using native plants in our landscapes, and also to generate um, a sufficient market and interest in those people providing uh, plants, so to work also with the horticulture industry, the nursery industry. And uh, our very first objective in doing that uh, educational campaign was to create a guide to what is a native plant in the Northern Virginia area, the four counties that we cover. Um, and so in uh, 2013, I believe for the first time, this Plant Nova Natives uh, guide uh, was produced with a great deal of uh, labor of uh, labors of love, uh, primarily by members of the Native Plant Society, but um, many of our other partnerships uh, took part in creating that. And then uh, another person from whom you'll hear, who is also effectively, she's our outreach chair for Plant Nova Natives, Margaret Fisher, uh, has overseen the development of a very, very rich um, social media campaign, including our website, which has riches that are um, untold for all of us. So we have been very pleased. Our objective was to try to reach 100,000 uh, members of the public. That was in that little you know, federal grant guide uh, initially. And we've been able to uh, finance ourselves sufficiently to keep the campaign going and to keep the guide in print. Uh, the guide is a wonderful resource for congregations and uh, is available for order and is uh, one uh, piece that can form part of uh, work that is being done in your faith congregation. So uh, you are welcome to contact uh, any of us who have been part of this program today and get more information uh, about how you could possibly do that. And we have managed to reduce the cost of printing this guide over the years uh, so that it is well within reach of faith congregations. Uh, so again, welcome for those who've been joining a little bit later. And um, thank you for being present in this forum. We hope to create a gracious space uh, for learning and for con conversation uh, this afternoon. Um, why a faith symposium? Why would we turn to uh, faith congregations uh, to take this message? Uh, because many faith congregations, we've realized uh, in our community, are spaces with considerable campuses. Um, and we are all um, swayed by the words of 
Dr. Doug Tallamy, our favorite entomologist who has taught us so much um, about gardening in our backyards and in, who in his most recent work, Nature's Best Hope, suggests that our best way forward in terms of preserving biological diversity uh, is to think upon our uh, backyards and our campuses in our, in our home settings as opportunities to uh, create a homegrown national park. Uh, so that's why um, we are addressing this. And uh, our plan for this afternoon is to hear from a series of experts who have been successful in uh, mounting and um, executing and are still overseeing projects in their faith um, communities. And we will um, hear from each of those panelists and uh, find out more about uh, the work that they're doing. And uh, we will hear from um, Renee Grebe of the Audubon Naturalist Society and Margaret Fisher on some specific subjects. And then we will be breaking up into uh, groups that uh, will give us more of an opportunity to converse with one another and uh, be a little more specific in our interests and what we'd like to pursue and know more about. We look forward to hearing uh, from you in all of that. Well, I would like then to uh, invite the Reverend Susan Hartzell, who had initially uh, agreed very graciously to host this uh, physically, and her congregation. So she's going to open our afternoon with prayer. And thank you very much, um, Reverend Susan. Yes, thank you, Joanne. It is good to be here. It would have been a beautiful day at St. Peter's in the Woods, but I trust good work is still going to be done amongst all of you today. So thanks for inviting me to open us with a prayer. And um, our Episcopal Book of Common Prayer has a beautiful thanksgiving for the beauty of the earth uh, that I thought I might share with you as we begin our work today. Let us pray. We give you thanks, most gracious God, for the beauty of earth and sky and sea, for the richness of mountains, plains and rivers, for the songs of birds and the loveliness of flowers. We praise you for these good gifts and pray that we may safeguard them for our posterity. Grant that we may continue to grow in our grateful enjoyment and care of your abundant creation. To the honor and glory of your name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Lovely. Thank you so much. And we'll be hearing from members of Susan's congregation a little bit later uh, in our panel discussions. But our first speaker this afternoon is going to be uh, the inimitable, energetic, and wonderful Margaret Fisher, uh, a member of the Herndon Friends Congregation, and uh, as I said, Outreach Director for the Plant Nova Natives Campaign. So Margaret, take it away. Okay, thank you so much. So um, I'm going to be talking specifically about native plants in a faith community setting. Native plants are not the only component of home habitat, but without native plants, you've got nothing. I could literally talk for hours on this subject, but since we don't have time for details, I hope to briefly mention the various issues and point you to resources for learning more. The photos in this presentation were taken at Herndon, Herndon Friends Meeting, which is my faith community, where we started adding pollinator gardens about six or eight years ago, and then did some major overhauls starting in 2017. Places of worship are ideal places to support wildlife and capture stormwater, since they're such large properties, many of them. Though making that transformation may be very much a long-term process. But they ha have even more to offer as a place to amplify the message about home habitat and good land stewardship. If you even just start with one plant and a sign, you will have accomplished something very important. In time, though, we hope to do a lot more with our common properties. So today we'll start by talking about rejuvenating existing conventional landscaping areas. 
We'll also talk about new planting areas, but they take more planning, so I'm going to talk about them separately. What can you point out to your congregation that might make them want to replace existing plants? People don't usually think about their landscaping until a problem comes up. But when one does, you want to be ready to take advantage of the opportunity. For one thing, shrubs don't live forever, uh, but they do tend to keep expanding even if you prune them regularly. They eventually tend to outgrow their site and end up on encroaching on the walkways or blocking the windows or just out of scale with the rest of the landscape. They often then suffer from repeated pruning to try to keep them from outgrowing their space, and they end up looking pretty sad. And that was what was true at Herndon Friends. Just as I wanted to get everybody to replace the plants, they happened to very kindly die on us <laughs> in part, and that was uh, helpful for the convincing process. But even without that kind of excuse to read landscape, more and more faith communities want to demonstrate stewardship of their land and replace ecologically sterile non-native plants and definitely get rid of those that are invasive and, and tend to escape into our natural areas where they crowd out the natives. Once you've made the decision to replace your plants with natives, then it's time to decide which plant species to use. Are you trying to keep the look the same? If that's the case, then I suggest minimizing the use of perennials and go for neat and tidy trees and shrubs, grasses and ground covers. We have lists of those neat and tidy plants on the Plant Nova Natives website. On the left, we have New Jersey tea and Virginia sweet spire. And on the right, you can see little blue stem being used as an ornamental grass. If you want, there actually are a few native shrubs that can be sheared into the meatball shapes that are so popular in conventional landscaping settings. But you'll save a lot of work if you choose shrubs whose full grown size will fit the space so no pruning is required. If you'd like to introduce a more natural look, that of course is also easily done and can be very beautiful as well with the right plant choices. Here we have golden ragwort as a ground cover on the left and eastern red columbine on the right, which has a nice long bloom time and is ever bit as nice as the non-native columbines. Let's say your property has a lot of empty space and you decide you want to start new planting areas. Often the first thing on people's mind is adding pollinator gardens, which are very fun and educational. I would encourage everyone to have a pollinator garden where you can show people the butterflies. My big suggestion there is that you just start out small. Erosion and stormwater control are other big motivations to add planting areas, and they're often called for under trees where the grass doesn't grow well enough to hold onto the soil, or in areas where stormwater is creating a problem for the building or for a neighbor's property. Native plantings can sometimes be an alternative to expensive engineering solutions. And that was actually the case at Grace Presbyterian, where they were planning a big retaining wall until they realized that they could hold the soil by adding shade-loving native plants instead. But hopefully you don't have to wait for a financial incentive to reduce lawn, since doing so is just being a good citizen because of all the environmental problems caused by large expanses of turf grass. If you're going to add new planting areas, these, there are four design issues that you'll always want to consider. The first is human function. How do you plan to use the space? You might be think of, thinking of creating shady sitting areas or worship spaces. You might like to have more privacy screening or screening of unattractive features such as air conditioning units. And you might need to use low plantings to maintain certain sight lines for drivers or for security. And most likely there are also some areas that you very much want to keep in lawn. That would be places where people walk or gather or where children run around. Turf grass is well designed for that kind of heavy use. In our case, we kept a wide path because the kids like to run around and around the building. But adding a planting bed next to the sidewalk had the added advantage of keeping them away from the road. The second design consideration is aesthetics. 
And for that, I recommend that you adopt basic garden design principles, which are just as applicable to native plants as to any others. There's much more to garden design than just color, which is what people tend to think of first. Color's great, but most of the time the colors of any, any landscape are going to be green or brown, and you want it to look good year round. Do your plants have variety of form and height and foliage texture that make them look good even when they're not blooming? Do you have plants that add interest in the winter? Evergreen plants are not the only or even the best way to provide winter interest. Then there's the overall look to the project. How does it look as a whole if you stand back and squint at it? Rhythm and repetition make a landscape more legible to the human brain. The human brain gets confused by randomness. Are the plantings in balance and proportionate to the building and to each other? Lines and focal points lead the eye and produce a sense of movement. Obscuring part of the landscape adds a sense of mystery and makes the space seem larger. Have you created an entrance area that makes a graceful transition between the street and the door? It is lack of good design that can give native plantings a bad name. Messiness, monotony, and randomness are where it's easy to go wrong. For example, many years ago, we created a pollinator garden on this embankment using a wide variety of plant species laid out in little groupings. The design looked good on paper, but little did we know that some goldenrod and aster species can really take over especially when planted in rich garden soil instead of, instead of the more scanty natural soil they're used to. It ended up looking horrible, with tall plants that look like weeds all summer until they finally bloomed in the fall. A landscape designer happened to come by to give us an estimate on another project, and when I asked him about this, his terse reply was that we should create a plant frame. We did that, and we, re we replaced the offending goldenrod with a tamer goldenrod species, and now it looks great, or at least I think it looks great. Other cues to care, as they are called, include human-made human elements such as pots or benches and interpretive signs. But you know your, your own congregation, and especially while people are getting used to the idea of native plants, you might want to stick to more formal looking rather than naturalized landscaping. Also, if your budget would allow it, consider hiring a native plant designer just to do a design for you, even if you don't want them to do the whole installation. But if you can afford to pay for the installation, you will be so happy. A professional native plant landscaping company can do in two days what would take you 10 years to complete. But asking our meeting for that much money was difficult without being able to show everyone what it would look like. So we simply started out by paying for a rough design. Um, the designer charged us $450, which we blew up onto a poster. And then we walked around the property with people to show them what would go where. The next design consideration is ecological function. The critters don't care what it looks like, but they do have other strong preferences. To name a few, Bees and butterflies need to eat all year, so you want to use a variety of plants to extend the bloom time from early spring to late fall. On the right, we have Virginia sweet spire blooming in late May, and on the left, butterfly weed and coreopsis, which take over in June. Think not so much in terms of ground cover as the ground layer where many critters live and overwinter. This includes the dead leaves as well as plants. Different bird species nest at different levels, so put in multi-layer plantings from the canopy trees to the ground. I saw a sparrow nesting under one of these sweet spires the other day where the leaves of the common violets form the ground layer. I couldn't see the nest, I just saw the um, sparrow fly into there and I'm just hoping there are no cats around. Birds need the berries of native shrubs and vines and their babies need the caterpillars that are manufactured, so to speak, by the leaves of trees. Specialist insects need their special plant species. If you plant a diversity of plants to feed the specialists, you'll also be feeding the generalists. 
Trees are particularly great for faith communities because you can use them to commemorate events or people, but trees don't like to be alone. Try to plant groves of trees spaced at 10 foot intervals. Stormwater basins may be the perfect place to put a meadow if all you have is an empty mowed bowl. But anything you do in a stormwater facility needs to be cleared by the county stormwater division first. When possible, try to buy straight species and local ecotypes. There is a significant difference between a plant that evolved in Florida and the same species that evolved in Virginia. Cultivars that have red or purple leaves instead of green or have altered flower shapes and colors are often no longer useful to the insects that depend on them. You can help bees save energy while foraging by grouping plants of the same species together. Providing a water source like a bird path is helpful for birds and butterflies. And of course, if you're able to create a pond where amphibians and dragonflies can breed, that would be a really big plus. Bare patches of ground provide breeding areas for ground nesting bees. So all those things I mentioned are some of the pieces that can go into restoring an ecosystem. But let me put in a plug for looking at the bigger picture. What did the original ecosystem on your property look like and that of any remaining nearby natural areas? Probably that was woods. The bigger the piece of contiguous natural area, the more species it can support. Can you expand the habitat value of adjacent or nearby natural areas by gradually reforesting? It's very easy to do this by allowing the woods to close in or planting more trees, allowing the fallen leaves to stay in place and editing out any non-native plants that come in, leaving the tree seedlings and other natives to sort themselves out. Most com common garden weeds, by the way, are non-native. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, I'd like to mention iNaturalist as a wonderful tool for educating yourself in your community. Photos you upload are identified by the computer, but also by real people who review them. One of its many features is that you can draw a boundary around a property on the map and create what they call a project in which every photo ever uploaded from that area in the past or in the future automatically populates this free website, which is automatically generated. At Herndon Friends, we have photographed and identified 99 species of animals using the property since we started at adding native plants. And our lot is only about a quarter acre, most of which is taken up by building and parking lot. So we're able to clearly show that planting native plants supports our fe fellow sentient beings. And pretty much everyone at meeting has started doing this at home, which of course was one of the main goals. I'd be very happy to help you set up an iNaturalist project for your property if you shoot me an email. The final design consideration is future maintenance. Who will be doing that maintenance? Any new planting area will need to be weeded, especially the first few years. It really helps to keep it manageable by working on one area at a time. This also makes it easier to water, which will be needed until the plants become established. And after that, you want to stop watering so the plants don't overgrow. If your volunteers or your paid staff for maintenance are limited, maybe you should stick to simple swap outs of invasive plants for native alternatives and keep your mulch beds, which any maintenance company can handle. It's hard to go wrong in a faith community setting if you stick to shrubs and trees or to the very, or at least to very easy perennials. You can still have plenty of variety and ecosystem value. But if you are somewhat more ambitious than that, it still helps to plant a limited number of species grouped together because it makes weed identification so much easier. And if you turn sunny areas into shade by expanding the tree canopy, you'll have a lot fewer weeds to contend with. Planting trees is the simplest way to do a lot of good for the environment. Don't forget the basics when planning any new plantings. Hardscape comes before softscape. Watch out for overhead lines and underground lines or underground pipes. Control the weeds and invasives before you plant. Make sure you have a water source. Do you have a, a faucet and can you reach 
your hose reach the new plants. Protect your plants from deer. Protect them from the mowers. Many a garden has been mowed down by lawn companies. Always use the full scientific binomial names. If you ask for a plant by its common name, you're very likely to come home with the wrong one, and often that may be a non-native. So now let me just briefly mention some resources that may help you. First of all, you don't really have to pay for mulch. You can get it free from the counties. The Plant Nova Native website is very much worth exploring if you haven't already. We've tried to make it kind of the go-to place for gardening with native plants in Northern Virginia. We have a big faith community section, and we have an even bigger homeowners association section, and most of the information in that section is very relevant to faith communities. We have a section on garden design. Um, we have one on grants and discounts. And we have a list of native plant only, or, na or native plant landscape designers, people who specialize in native plants. And we have a list of native plant sources, which includes several native plant only nurseries in Northern Virginia, but also the conventional nurseries. There are about 21 of them that allow our volunteers to go in and put red tags on the native plants. So all you have to do is walk along and look for the red tag to identify a native. You might also want to buy some of your plants by mail order. There are a couple native plant mail order companies, um, and that's especially useful when you want to get a much lower price for ground cover or other things that you're buying in bulk. And there also are a few seedling sales and giveaways where you can get trees and some shrubs for free or close to free. If you need some advice, the great place to start would be the Audubon at Home program where volunteers such as myself and many of the people on this call <laughs> um, will come out to your faith community or to your home or your HOA or anywhere and walk the property with you and talk about whatever your landscaping goals are and help you decide what might be a good way to create habitat. Also, um, I mentioned about stormwater uh, facilities, those bowls. If you're contemplating doing any changes there, you want to consult with the stormwater division. They might even come out, but more likely you could send them pictures and um, your, your thoughts and they can help you decide what's actually going to work in that setting. And finally, my hope is that we can build an interfaith community where we help each other. And we have a Facebook group for this purpose. It's called Sowing Seeds of Stewardship Nova. And of course, it's often easy to go look, around, look at the grounds of other people's places of worship. You're more, well, more than welcome to walk around on Herndon Friends Meeting property, where we have labeled most of the plants in our formal um, planting beds. So thank you very much. And um, please feel free to email me any questions and I'll try to point you in the right direction. And Margaret, do you want to address um, the ordering of quantities of guides for faith congregations. Thank you. That is, putting that guide in someone's hand is a great way to actually move them to action. And you can get them um, at a discount. There are, if you get 10 or more, it's only $3.50 each. So that's on the website how to do that. Thank you so much, Margaret. That was wonderful. So interesting to see what you've been able to do in, in your space in Herndon. Really appreciate your putting that together. Uh, Renee Greedy is going to uh, take over now and address some other issues with the Audubon Naturalist Society, and you'll tell us a bit more about ANS, I trust. That's excellent. Thanks, Joanne. I'm Renee Greedy. I am the Northern Virginia Conservation Advocate for the Audubon Naturalist Society. We're the oldest independent, ecologically focused um, nonprofit in the DC area. And we are a great partner with Plant Nova Natives. I personally love Plant Nova Natives and I'm really excited to be able to talk to you today. So I'll be taking a quick 20 minutes to talk about sustainable landscaping maintenance for faith communities. So what we're gonna to cover today is water, and watersheds and sustainable ideas so you can understand 
why we'll talk about lawn care, tree care, and natural areas. And then I'll also cover a few additional resources that Margaret highlighted some, and I'll continue that as well. So why do watershed, water and watersheds matter? So this, uh, yeah, water is life. This is a poster from the Standing Rock Sioux indigenous people who have led protests against the building of the Dakota Access Pipeline because they understood the threat to drinking water. And Miniwakoni is Lakota for water is life. Adult humans are about 60% water and some organisms are as much as 90% water. And that's important because without that water, there's not life. And whatever's in the water is in us. So I know this segment is addressing landscaping maintenance, but it's really important to understand that land and water and air, they're all intimately connected. And this is where the sustainable part of, of the discussion comes in. Trees and natural vegetation prevent erosion and trap and filter and slow and clean water. Whatever's on that land is in the water and to have clean water, you have to protect the land. And that land drains into any given body of water, which is a watershed. So we were originally supposed to be meeting at St. Peter's in the Woods. That's where St. Peter's in the Woods is in the watershed. And this is a map showing watersheds, some of the watersheds of Fairfax County. And each of these watersheds, they drain into some rivers and eventually the Potomac River, which is where some of our drinking water in the Northern Virginia region comes from. And in context, the Potomac River is part of the broader Chesapeake Bay watershed. So whatever's in the water in our area ends up in the bay. And whatever ends up in the bay obviously ends up in the ocean as well. So as part of our broader Potomac River and Chesapeake Bay watersheds, what do we do to affect our broader environment? And I think recognizing this question, understanding it is key to what sustainable is. So I'll use the example of impervious surface as an example to understand impact. As our metro area has grown, so have the number of roofs, patios, decks, sidewalks. And I'll flip back and forth between this one and the last one. This is 1984 versus 2010. So it's 25 years of growth. You can see the intensity of the blue areas that's more impervious paved surfaces. And this data is 10 years old now, so you can imagine how much more we have. So that's the what. Well, what is the so what? With all of this increased impervious surface, you know, what gets washed down from our properties into streams? The salt we put on our driveways, parking areas, and sidewalks in the winter, the fertilizers on our lawns, fluids that leak from cars, and a bunch of the other things you see here on the screen. And with this increased impervious surface, that polluted runoff is often rushing down into our stream beds. And it affects our local parks in ways that we have big erosion issues. And I think this is just part of the, of the issue of sustainability, seeing how we are a component of the broader environment. So what we say at the Audubon Naturalist Society is that one thing you can really think about in terms of sustainable landscaping is in terms of water, slow it down, spread it out, and soak it in. If you do this, lots of things get rectified in terms of addressing the clean water issue. And you can do this via rain gardens or conservation landscaping. Uh, we're not gonna talk about those concepts in depth, but it's a way to get the water to get into the ground. That is something we will be talking a lot about. So just how much storm water is there? This is an example from a 1,000 square foot roof, pretty small. Um, in a rainstorm, you can have a rain barrel that you can connect to your downspout. There are reasons why this can be cumbersome in terms of maintenance, but this is just as an example. 50 gallon rain barrel can collect water. In one inch of a rainstorm, you will need so many barrels to capture all of that water, 623 gallons. So when you think about that rainstorm that we had last July, where we got three to four inches of rain and about a month's worth of rain in about two hours, that would have been about 1,800 or 2,500 gallons of water from just one 1,000 foot roof. So you can see how managing storm water in terms of keeping our water clean is really important. So things we can do are to disconnect our downspouts. Ideally, put them directly into a vegetated area that can really absorb that water, like a rain garden or conservation landscaping. And then I mentioned rain barrels as well, but you have to make sure that as you're working on the rain barrel, that you empty it out and allow that to be refilled. So that could be a cumbersome if someone's not there using it constantly. 
another thing you can do is just reduce turf grass. And we'll talk about that in a little bit as well, but uh, anywhere there's grass you don't use, Margaret mentioned this, plant something. Um, you can see here on the right from Beth L. Uh, Hebrew, who we're actually here from in a little bit, they were able to put in this nice garden next to an impervious surface of the sidewalk. And in terms of building a rain garden, this is something you could do. You can see uphill from this, the water can come right down to this area. Before this garden, it may have been, um, you know, a bit of a wet area. And instead, building a wall and having a place for that to be uh, gathered is great. This is from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation in Fairfax. So when you think about what native plants can do, I like to think about them being a really important component of landscape maintenance, not just from what you see above, or la landscaping and sustainability, not just what you see above, but also what you see below. When we think about issues like um, erosion, native plants can be a real help. When you think about turf grass, that's turf grass. It's very short and it has very short roots. But as an example of some prairie plants, you can see how deep these roots go. Now, I know we don't live in the prairie, but it's a good example of what different root structures might be for native plants. And as we think about what you can do in terms of mitigating erosion, this is from St. Peter's in the Woods that, who put in a hillside of native plants. And if you go to the Google drive-by shot, you can see what that looks like as of whenever that picture was taken, I imagine sometime recently. You can think about how you can reduce your impermeable surface. So if you have a driveway or a sidewalk, can you replace it with permeable pavement? This is, can be complex because it can take maintenance to make sure it stays permeable, but it's a really good alternative for areas that you can do it in. And green roofs. Again, these take maintenance as well, but think about where you might have impervious surface and where you might be able to make it more impervious. So we'll talk about the elephant in the room, lawns. We all have lawns uh, and our faith communities often, they're, they're a very uh, staying piece of the landscape, um, but they're also something that can be managed in a more sustainable way. So frequently lawn maintenance is done with chemicals and not only do these treatments cost money, but they also contribute to a degraded environment, something particularly impactful in our urban and suburban areas where the pressures are so great. So I say, how can we do this without chemicals? So first, just the way the lawn is mowed can be one of the simplest things you can change in order to make sure your lawn is the healthiest it can be. If you set your mower height to three to four inches, taller if you can, it means a few things. It means first, the grass will be taller, which means it will send out deeper roots. Any kind of deeper roots mean more absorption of water and nutrients from the ground. And it also means that your grass is gonna have deeper roots for times of drought, they'll be more drought tolerant. And also this length can help keep weeds out of the way by essentially shading out the other weeds that might grow there. And in fact, this one tip of just mowing is one of the keystones that you might need to a well-established uh, lawn, because once you have it be well-established, you really shouldn't need fertilizers or weed killers. But another thing you can think about in terms of your lawn, if you aren't at a place where you have a perfect lawn already that doesn't need chemicals or fertilizers, is to really develop a nutrient management plan. And there are organizations like the Master Gardeners and the Virginia Extension that can help you develop these. It'll take some soil testing across your property to see what is in your soil and what it might need. And so think about doing that before you dive into just simply putting on fertilizers. If your nutrient management plan determines that you need fertilizers, one thing you might be able to do is simply to mulch your leaves back into your ground in order to replenish some of that nutrients. But if you do need fertilizer, be sure to do it properly. Do it only during the months of the year where the grass is growing and not when it's dormant. Those are the highlighted buds here in yellow. And think about applying less of the fertilizer than the, uh, the bag might say because uh, more is not always better, except for in the profit of the pockets of the manufacturers who make these products. So just use it in a way that is sustainable until you get your lawn to where it needs to be. And then think too about how you can make areas of your lawn you have as spongy and as water absorbent as possible. Compacted areas make it hard for grass to grow and it doesn't really allow the water to soak in. So what you want to do is make sure you aerate your lawn in the areas that make the most sense. That will allow pockets, sort of like you're poking a hole in a, um, 
plastic wrapped sponge so that that sponge can really absorb the water, the sponge of the earth. And then think about reducing the lawn, like Margaret mentioned. Think about reducing your lawn when you can. If there are places that people don't use for recreation, think about putting in a rain garden next to some impervious surface. You can see here how the water would come right off the road and go into this little bit of a ditch. That's perfect. We'll talk briefly about tree care as well. So as you think about your tree care, make sure uh, if you're lucky enough to have trees on your property, they, need, they too need continual maintenance, maintenance. So be sure to work with a certified arborist. You wanna make sure that you have someone who knows the best for you and will do the best in terms for your trees in terms of trimming or helping with that difficult decision of when is actually a time to remove a tree. And also as your trees are marked for removal, as you see in this picture, does your congregation have a tree replacement policy? Tree succession takes many years to ensure a good, healthy, long-term tree canopy, and uh, you wanna make sure you plan for that as you're taking trees out. One large tree can capture a lot of water. We talked about that big storm in July being able to capture a few thousand gallons of water, and if you think about over the course of a year, a tree can really help address that issue. So if you have wet areas, like Margaret said, stay with some simple landscaping and just plant a tree. It can be the easiest solution sometimes. And as you think about mulching your trees, what you really want to avoid are mulch volcanoes. We don't want them. What they can do is make strangling roots of the trees like you can see here. And so what you think is actually helping the tree with the mulch is actually ultimately killing it. You want to keep your mulch about four feet wide, four inches thick, and about four inches away from your trunk. And eventually, once your tree is really well established, you may not even need mulch anymore. We don't, the trees in the forest aren't mulched. It's really because once you have a good shade for that area, then it really protects itself. It's just when it's starting out. So if you're lucky enough to have natural areas, you also probably wanna be thinking about invasive plants. Invasive plants are often what we see is sold in big box stores, things like English ivy. And you can see here what a problem in this natural area they become. They've gone up the tree and they're strangling it. There are many kinds of vines that will do this too, uh, in addition to English ivy. And you, know, you really wanna look at your areas and see how you can protect them the most you can from that to protect your long-term tree canopy. Think about the way you might manage your leaves on your property as well. If you have leaves in the woods, don't blow them out of the woods, that's where they're meant to be. If you have leaves that fall in your grass, don't blow those leaves into the woods. You can mulch them back into your lawn like we talked about, or you can dispose of them properly. Um, but make sure you're managing that properly, the managing of the leaves. And then if you have dead trees, particularly in natural areas, know that dead trees mean life to a lot of animals. There are a lot of birds like this Carolina chickadee that need cavities to nest in, and those are most easily found in dead wood. So think about if you have something that's easily, safely left, leave it there. If you're lucky enough to have a stream or a water feature on your property, think about if it has buffers. This one in this picture does not have enough buffers on it. Those buffers can help hold that stream together uh, on big storms when water comes rushing through here, and it can help stabilize the banks to avoid that erosion. What you really want is something more like this where you have some sort of buffers along it. And again, if you work in an RPA or any kind of water area, make sure you're working with your local um, locale to see if they have any permits that you might need to work in there. So in terms of resources to help, Soil and Water Conservation District is my absolute favorite organization. They um, have a seedling sale each year. They do, more, most importantly, do this VCAP, um, Virginia Conservation Assistance Program. And the fact that you can get money is really exciting to and compelling to a lot of organizations. Um, you can get up to 75% of a project cost reimbursed, which can equal about $3,500 in terms of rain gardens or maybe $20,000 in terms of cisterns. Um, and this is the only example I have of places that will give you money. Um, but of note is that there are lots of other organizations that we're gonna talk through. And like Margaret mentioned with Audubon at Home, which will give you time. And we all know time is money. So Audubon at Home is one that Margaret mentioned. Don't forget them. That's a wonderful organization. They can come out and do site visits for you. And they're having a pilot program for neighborhoods and community associations to certify them. And maybe they'll extend that to faith communities as well. Urban foresters are fantastic. They're a wonderful resource. They can come out and do site visits for your property as well. They can write up woodland management plans, help you with riparian buffer restorations if you have water features. 
Um, they're just a really great resource that's independent um, and will give, of, again, of their time. We mentioned the Virginia Cooperative Extension and the Master Gardeners in terms of lawn practices. They can be very helpful to um, pesticide, insecticide usage, tree care, living with wildlife, another wonderful resource. Margaret already touched on Plant Nova Natives, just wanted to highlight that too. It's great because you can get sample maintenance contracts on the website and uh, like I said, information about working in RPA's resource protection areas near streams and so much more. It's just a wonderful resource of a website. And then as Margaret mentioned, don't forget paid help. Paid help can be really helpful when you're thinking about a showcase landscaping area that you need a lot of people to be comfortable with. Um, so think about what kind of professionals might be out there. Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professionals is an organization that really understands bayscaping. Uh, companies that do restorations and arborists familiar with natives can be helpful to ask about. And then in terms of invasive plants, don't forget invasive plant control companies. Um, invasive Plant Control, IPC, is an organization that does a lot of work in Fairfax County. We've used them in our homeowners association and they're really great um, in that in terms of that case, sometimes we do have to use chemicals to combat the worst of the invasives, um, but they use them very responsibly. And so making sure you work with an organization that does that responsibly is helpful. So just to recap what we learned in this quick 20 minutes or so, for water, just think about in your landscaping practices, how you can slow it down, spread it out and soak it in. For lawns, mow high, avoid unnecessary additives and don't forget to aerate to keep that sponginess there. For trees, certified arborist, don't forget to mulch properly, and don't forget to plan for tree replacement. And for natural areas, treat invasives and manage leaves properly, plant buffers, and keep dead trees when you can. There's so many resources out there. A lot of these are listed on the Plant Nova Natives website, and you'll also get this, uh, all these slides for all of the presenters at the end as well. So thank you, that's my contact information if you need it. Um, and also, we're going to head into a break, so you get three minutes to stretch your legs now. Thank you so much, Renee. Wonderful presentations, both. And uh, I, learned, I learned something from watching them as well. Um, yeah, please do stand up, stretch, go to the bathroom, do whatever you might need to do. In the meantime, um, I have entered into the, the chat room some information, um, but there have been two queries of particular note. Uh, the first was about plant labeling, and sometimes it's useful to share information about that, In because Margaret, I know, mentioned uh, signage. So I don't know if you have labels at Herndon Friends, Presbyter uh, Herndon Friends but uh, I, I mentioned one uh, plant maps, which is a Virginia company, uh, with more of an international, actually they're, they're supplying labels around the world uh, and, and they have done a very nice job in a local demonstration garden that I oversee in our local park. Anyone else um, in, among our presenters who've had experience with this? Uh, yeah, I'll, when, I'll send out in our follow-up email the name of the company that we've been using at our meeting. Um, Bamboo uh, eradication was something else. I've sent you um, material uh, from what is called the Home Garden Information Center, HGIC, uh, at Clemson. Uh, that is one of the cooperative extension programs that Renee referred to. Uh, and uh, they offer always the best science-based information that you can uh, achieve if you're trying to do research on something like bamboo eradication. A good way to do that, just a hint, is to um, type in what you're interested in, in this case, bamboo eradication, and after that, site, S-I-T-E colon, E-D-U, and you will get results only from universities, and in this case, it will be the land-grant schools that support the Cooperative Extension who are um, trying to get this information out to the public. Um, so that, uh, it, the tip, the tip I have, if you're just trying to contain bamboo when it's growing, you go out and kick it over when it's still, you know, six inches high and tender and hasn't become woody. But uh, getting bamboo out uh, permanently is a big, um, that's a big issue. And the screening to replace it would be another topic that we may or may not um, have time for.
Uh, and the question also came in uh, about um, aeration. Quite often, the cooperative extension uh, recommendations are to aerate in the late summer, early fall, uh, along with reseeding your lawn. Okay. All right. Well, I think we're um, probably ready to uh, move along on our uh, in our program uh, to holding our panel discussions. And um, so I would like to begin by introducing Dave Smith, uh, who is a member of St. Andrew's Episcopal Church in Arlington, Virginia. And he'll be talking about uh, the, their feeding garden called a Garden of Hope. Dave? Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, it's uh, quite a pleasure to be here with you. Uh, what I wanted to talk to you this afternoon about is our um, project to uh, our plot for hunger that uh, we have been doing now for 12 years at St. Andrews. And we are part of a uh, consortium of uh, gardens across um, uh, Northern Virginia. In Arlington alone, I believe there are about 40 different gardens that help supply uh, fresh vegetables um, to uh, the various food banks. Um, in the area. And so um, hopefully you can see the slide deck now. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a willing group of volunteers with, uh, as you can tell later in the season, uh, with their, uh, their vegetables. St. Andrews is a relatively small uh, parish. We have about um, 250 uh, members. And, uh, but we're very, uh, outward facing and do a lot of uh, various uh, projects and it, there is clearly interest throughout the parish in, in outreach and so this has become one of our um, one of our uh, primary projects that we uh, we help uh, the local community with the uh, nice thing about um, this kind of work is that we get lots of uh, community volunteers also not only is the parish interested, but we, we have a partnership with uh, Marymount University in the upper uh, right-hand corner. You can see the, uh, the men's lacrosse team and the women's soccer team that volunteered uh, uh, a couple of times for us last year. And uh, then a number of other uh, organizations um, from around uh, the uh, Northern Virginia area uh, will come and volunteer too. So. I think these gardens actually create a, great, a greater uh, sort of community interest also. Um, and then uh, things have changed a bit this year because of the pandemic. And so this is a picture uh, a couple of weeks ago just showing. And now we have to rely primarily on our, um, our church volunteers. But uh, to date, we're, uh, we're clearly uh, doing very well with the garden uh, and we have a few uh, volunteers that have been regulars uh, coming from our um, AFEC uh, group to help support us. But as you can tell, uh, good social distancing, uh, wear our masks, and we're outdoors, but uh, uh, clearly trying to use good public health hygiene to continue this uh, effort. And um, just, uh, of course, there's always planting and plenty of weeding in a vegetable garden. We have about 6,000 square feet. Uh, we're blessed, like many um, churches, with uh, a large um, campus, and so this was one way that we could convert some of it to uh, be able to uh, help uh, help the community and uh, make it fertile. Um, and then, of course, delivering. And here's uh, some of our produce, along with, uh, again, various volunteer groups, and uh, we typically package on-site to make it ready so that it can be immediately used by the clients at the, uh, at the food bank. Now, um, what have we learned in all of this? Well, first, that clearly it has been very popular, not only with the uh, parish, but also uh, embraced by those that learn about it. And it um, appe clearly appeals to a broad audience of, uh, of uh, folks around the community. And if folks are not able to work, they often are willing to uh, contribute funds. We, we have uh, been doing this long enough now that we're actually a line item in the church budget. 
but I'm proud to say that um, angels basically uh, pay for that part of the, uh, the budget and um, uh, the church itself uh, no longer needs to uh, sustain it other than providing the support with the people and the, uh, uh, the, the labor, obviously. And I think it is a way that churches can clearly uh, live their stewardship ministry and, um, and help others within their community that clearly need the, uh, the support. Now, for our size garden, I have to admit, it clearly uh, requires um, some experienced garden leadership, but it's also another one of the wonderful features of this. There's plenty of mentorship that goes on, and we have, I would say, at least half of our members who have never um, done any kind of gardening uh, that will that are able to learn from the experience. And that's particularly true of uh, a number of our uh, volunteer groups, such as the, uh, the kids from Marymount, um, who have often uh, never seen things other than in the grocery store uh, relative to uh, the various vegetables that we're growing. But any size garden is clearly uh, very valuable. We've now been doing it, as I say, this is we're beginning our 12th year. Um, every year has been different, different set of volunteers. Um, we continually adjust our produce based on what the food banks uh, say are popular with the clients. Um, and of course, um, are nutritious, but uh, they most of them have grown up in the United States. So there are certain things that are very familiar and other things that are not. So we tend to try to not uh, grow too many exotic vegetables, if you will. Now, how do we actually communicate? It's primarily virtually. Uh, we have a sign of genius. It's the way that we get our waterers, our weeders, and uh, for folks to know when we're doing um, uh, work days at the garden. We also, uh, when it's not just, we have an e-news that our uh, parish uses, and since it's primarily been parish members, I've not been putting out the regular emails this year, but normally we have a large email group that uh, uh, keeps everybody uh, informed and interested in what we're doing. Our results um, over the, the last 11 years, we had uh, contributed about um, a little over 22,000 pounds of vegetables uh, to Ar the Arlington Food Assistance Center. Uh, we're doing well this year with our kale and our collards and our lettuce. We're up to about 200 pounds right now. Um, AFAC is not accepting vegetables this year directly from gardens, and so we have needed to uh, readjust, and we have a group um, that's very active across Arlington that has uh, established um, other liaisons with other smaller food banks, and that is how we're distributing it. Our Episcopal Diocese of Virginia has clearly been uh, very supportive and helped us start with some outreach grants. And we've also had uh, local businesses that have don donated supplies for deer and rabbit fencing, which you can invariably know, just like with uh, uh, Nova Natives, uh, is a, can be a problem. And um, I think this has been a, uh, a continuing wonderful uh, project that has allowed us to take advantage of uh, land that uh, previously was uh, primarily in turf. Um, we have also expanded another section of our uh, campus uh, with a group of apple trees that were uh, gradually wow. working through the issues of growing apples in the, uh, in the Virginia area. And um, uh, we hope will in the future produce um, large quantities of apples also for the, uh, for the food bank. So with that, this is a picture from just yesterday at one of our work days at, uh, at our garden. Um, so I'll look forward to any questions and uh, the breakout session later. Thank you very much. That's wonderful, Dave. Thank you and congratulations. And we know, um, we know the kind of hard work and time and dedication that a project like this takes. So I'm sure your leadership has been significant. I have one question because we have just one minute to uh, ask about the initial buy-in and selling this project uh, within your congregation. Is there uh, anything sure. about that? Uh, it was, uh, early on, it was actually um, an individual in our congregation that worked for the uh, 
uh, Department of Agriculture when they created a garden down on the mall um, as part of a push for uh, urban gardens and um, uh, specifically to provide uh, produce where uh, often produce is not available. And so she, uh, she brought the idea up with the, um, with the congregation. I think everybody uh, was uh, very pleased to be able to use the property, but recognized how much work it would actually be. And for the first couple of years, we actually had a uh, paid consultant to help with the, uh, the running of the garden. But as we, we learned from um, him and uh, saw the success, we de determined that we could do this uh, as a fully uh, volunteer project. And so that's basically how it has proceeded. Wonderful, thank you very, very much. All right, we will, uh, we will hear next from Ed Sabo uh, at St. John Newman's Catholic Church, uh, where he serves on the Care for Our Common Home Committee, and we'll talk about their projects. So yes, I'm with the, uh, what we call the Care for Our Common Home Ministry at St. John Newman Catholic Church in Ruston. Um, just some background on the, the facility and the church. It's a large parish, quite 4,000 families. 10,000 members, although <clears throat> there's some debate about that. I think uh, we have a lot of people on the list that we need to call. Um, it's a large property, it's about seven acres, but uh, at the top of the screen, the back three and a half acres is located on a floodplain um, going down to the Glade stream in, in Reston. But we do have some trails on the church ground that are linked to this uh, extensive Reston network. And there are other locations along the campus where we have opportunities for sacred spaces. Um, one of our goals is to get people outside and appreciate this, uh, you know, force that we have behind us as a contemplative space. And that's especially important now with COVID-19 where we have uh, spaces where people can congregate, but, you know, still socially distance themselves. Um, with respect to eco-friendly landscaping, um, you know, a group of us came together and, and wanted to uh, investigate the whole concept more. Um, our, our core group is, are not gardeners, we're not botanists, we're <laughs> biologists, we're, you know, engineers and scientists, uh, environmentally focused, but not, not really familiar with eco-friendly landscaping. So, one of the first things we did, and I think uh, the two previous speakers mentioned this also, was we uh, invited a Virginia master naturalist from the Audubon at Home uh, program, uh, Kim Scudera. And she came out to our site and uh, walked around the facility with our facilities manager. We have a paid facilities manager since we have a large campus and, and infrastructure. and. Uh, just took two hours and walked around the, you know, various gardens and empty spaces. And she developed a, a, about a dozen different recommendations for us for reducing lawn size so it wasn't used, removing invasive species, uh, creating new native garden plants. Um, so we took that information and, and debriefed our pastor and our, um, worked with our facilities manager and began slowly implementing some of these recommendations. Um, as I think Margaret said, it, it takes, takes time to do it. You can't just start ripping everything out and putting in native plants. Um, we were asked to, to provide sort of a decision-making process, and, and this is just a general process that we use kind of for all of our uh, sustainability activities at the church. Um, uh, step one is to find people who share a common interest. And, and these, some people are interested in gardening, some people are interested in energy efficiency, some people are interested in reducing plastic waste. So we come up with a, a group who would be interested in eco-landscaping. Um, and as I said, we're not experts by any means on eco-landscaping. So uh, the next step was to educate ourselves. And, and there are tons of resources. Um, Renee and Margaret mentioned some of them, but um, the Audubon at Home program was very helpful. Plant Noted Natives, 
space of ions. Uh, there's just a tremendous amount of information out there. So we slowly kind of educated ourselves um, to, to figure out how we could implement some of the recommendations from Audubon at home. Um, and next, we went and coordinated with our pastor and our parish staff. We needed to get buy-in from, from them to implement any kind of project we wanted to undertake. Um, and fortunately, both our uh, facilities manager and our pastor were very enthusiastic about uh, proceeding with some of these things, which was very encouraging. And then the final step was to come up with, you know, some specific projects that we could actually get done in a reasonable time uh, to implement uh, some of the recommendations. So what I wanted to do next was um, just go through a, a process. Margaret touched on it a little bit early on, building a pollinator garden. So we were fortunate enough to find an Eagle Scout who was looking for an Eagle Scout project. And um, he, he went to our facilities manager and we talked with the facilities manager and we said, how about building a pollinator garden in a grassy area? So this is just sort of a synopsis of, of our process for getting that pollinator garden done. And, and you know, most of the work was done by the Eagle Scout, but he had a lot of resources from our group and facilities manager and outside groups in getting this done. So the first step was his rudimentary design where he picked a 10 by 20 foot design. And he found this, uh, the town of Herndon had actually built a couple of these uh, gardens of that size. And I noticed one at the Herndon Golf Course and I said, well, this might be a good prototype for you to copy. Um, so he, he, he laid out a design, 10 feet by 20 feet, which is fairly substantial. Um, then the next thing was to go about selecting what kind of plants we would put in a pollinator garden. And, um, you know, Margaret and others had mentioned this beautiful document, uh, Native Plants for Northern Virginia. He um, also consulted with uh, the town of Herndon on what plants they put in. Um, we got him in, con or we contacted um, Cindy Quackerbord, I think she's a butterfly garden expert, um, and she gave us some ideas. Um, the third step was, you know, we had this large grassy area on the, uh, on the far end of the campus, and our facility manager obviously wanted to reduce some of his maintenance costs by getting rid of some of the grass and all for uh, uh, a pollinator garden. But obviously step three there, we couldn't have 16 year old uh, Boy Scouts out there with a giant rototiller to get the soil grass removed and the soil prepared. So fortunately some of the parents of the Boy Scouts um, were able to do that, rototilling, getting the ground ready. Um, then the fourth step, uh, we had a large turnout of, of people once we purchased the native plants, um, we went about installing them. Um, my fifth photo there is, you know, it was nice to have such a great turnout to build this pollinator garden and to have the young people involved in doing most of the work. And then the final step is, as I think Margaret mentioned this, we um, uh, put some signage up there. This is the Monarch, Monarch Way Station, just to help educate people about, you know, what this pollinator garden does. So that's just one particular project that we did um, that I wanted to highlight. Um, Margaret also asked that I talk about how do we engage the rest of the community um, in learning about eco-friendly landscaping. And so, like I mentioned already, we have an excellent working relationship with our facilities manager who works for our, works with our um, lawn maintenance, landscape maintenance contractor um, to reduce pesticide use and, and that sort of thing. Um, we have monthly meetings, our Care for Our Common Home Ministry, we have monthly meetings and from time to time we'll have uh, outside speakers come in and talk about things. So they, I've just highlighted three uh, speakers that we had. We had Barbara Tussett, uh, uh, Audubon Home Ambassador, talking about uh, home landscaping. Uh, we're fortunate to have a professional beekeeper in our parish who actually has some hives on our ground. And he talked about the importance of bees and how bees are uh, just critical to the ecosystem. 
Uh, and then we had another presentation from an interpreter at the Hidden Oaks Nature Center who talked about home landscaping. So that's one way where we can engage in the parish community. Um, <clears throat> some of the other areas, um, we decided to do a roadside cleanup, which isn't really landscaping, but it, um, it increases awareness of environmental issues and sustainability issues. And it, uh, it lets our parishioners know that we care about the environment. And also lets the neighboring community know that we care about the environment. Um, as I mentioned, we've had, um, we have a large uh, swap of woods behind the facility. So we've organized some events to get people out into nature. Um, we've lucky enough to have a, a couple of bird enthusiasts who've taken some of us out who know nothing about birds and gave us binoculars and, and we looked uh, you know through the woods for the various types of birds and uh, just to, to enjoy the, the outdoor space that we do have. Um, and then we, we've had a couple of outdoor prayer walks where we get people out you know in that backwoods and, and appreciate nature. The middle sign there, this bioretention basin sign was an educational effort. Um, we host a farmer's market in our lower parking lot. Um, well, not this year, but hopefully it will restart soon. Um, and most of the people park in the, in the upper parking lot. So to get to the farmer's market, a lot of people were cutting through what was uh, known as a bioretention basin. And um, our facilities manager was getting upset about that because he's required by the county to keep that, you know, up to snuff and, and organize. So we developed some, some signage to try to educate people on what a bioretention basin is. Um, you know, collects the water off our parking lot, et cetera. So that's just some educational things we've tried to do as a community. Um, we've also tried to engage our, our youth um, at the elementary school level. Uh, one successful idea we had was a, a nature photo contest for middle and high school students um, to get them out into nature and appreciate, uh, you know, God's majesty. So. Um, and, and that was fairly successful. You know, every every middle school and high school kid has a phone now, and some of them have cameras on their phone that are much better than you know our old uh, old phones and our old, old uh, cameras. So uh, that was nice. And, and as I mentioned, the Eagle Scout pollinated garden project. Um, on a much larger scale, we're, we've done some engagement with a Catholic greater Catholic community. Um, there's an organization called uh, St. Kateri Habitat uh, Program. So we applied for a registration or certification there. We haven't installed the sign yet, but that'll be coming up soon. There's another way to, to educate people about the importance of habitat. And they have a nice website, and then that's what's focused on this page. They, they've registered about 90 different um, gardens or, or habitats around the country. And if you go to that website, you can scroll through where they're located and what they've done. So you can get a lot of good ideas of what you might be able to do on your behalf. Um, and then finally, our current project is um, we had a parish family build, build these pillars that we installed adjacent to the uh, woods behind the church um, as a way to to attract people back there and call them prayer pillars. Um, but because of the COVID-19 um, issue, um, previously we, had, uh, we have a group of about 40 high school students who are called work campers who go out in the community and, and would do different projects like building wheelchair ramps or painting old folks homes and things like that. But this year they couldn't, um, do that, get out in the community. So we've been able to arrange for them to socially distance themselves, but do a lot of work that would improve access to our, our nature trails, um, build some benches for people to, uh, and prayer card boxes so people can get outdoors and uh, enjoy nature and pray. And then we have a, an existing outdoor chapel it's pictured at the bottom that was built by another Eagle Scout about 10 years ago. 
but it hasn't been very well maintained, so they're going to do some maintenance on that uh, outdoor amphitheater. And um, eventually, this is an area where we would like to do some native planting around that area. And we may need to, uh, I, I like the idea of consulting with a professional landscaper for doing that. So, um, so that's just a sort of a summary of what we're doing at St. John Newman. Uh, there's my contact information. And uh, so thank you for listening. Ed, thank you very much for mm -hmm. taking us to your wonderful campus. That was fabulous. Um, and it's so encouraging to see the projects that um, people of faith are able to pull together. Next, we will see another um, equally beautiful uh, undertaking uh, by, at Temple Bethel in Alexandria. And Nancy and Stuart Davis uh, will talk with us about what they've been busy doing with their congregation. I'm Stuart Davis, and this is my wife, Nancy Davis. We're from Bethel Hebrew Congregation in Alexandria. We're both tree stewards, and Nancy's also a master gardener. In 1957, we outgrew our building in Old Town, Alexandria, without a yard, and moved to our seminary road location. And until March, the synagogue was a very busy place, with religious school, religious services, social activities, continuing education, community service, and a year-round preschool. Much of this continues online. The building has a two and a half acre, two acre forest drained by two steep ravines. The forest was largely unmanaged until 2002 when we started to take our environment seriously. To engage the congregation, we focused, we focused on the synagogue's primary mission of promoting and living Jewish values. Particularly when we teach seventh graders why we are improving the forest, we talk about how particularly in Genesis and Deuteronomy, the Torah teaches us to take care of the earth and we, uh, so we talk about two character traits such as sadaka, which means justice, and tikkun olam, which means repairing the earth. I, and I'm pasting the Reformed Judaism stated views on the environment into the chat box. Now, um, in 2002, the Chapel in Woods became the, the pet interest of Rabbi Arnold Fink and became a project of the Bethel Brotherhood. And it was managed by a longtime Brotherhood board member and landscaper, Jay Jarvis. Brotherhood members and other congregants turned out to work on numerous occasions. Two Eagle Scouts projects included a footpath across the East Ravine and a, another footpath around and a footpath around the area. The map, this is a map from the, the 2007 strategic plan that shows a very ambitious agenda that includes areas for religious, social, and educational activities, as well as tree planting and wildlife habitat. Now after Jake Jarvis moved away and the Brotherhood support lessened, the area became overrun by invasives, especially English ivy. After two or three years, a group of us came together informally to address the growing invasive infestation and other maintenance problems. One member of the group gave the synagogue a grant to call in Invasive Plant Control Incorporated to alleviate some of our misery. Beyond the persistent problem of invasive control, we also continue to have problems with erosion, stormwater runoff, 
trash and trees that need continual care and ambiguities in the decision-making process also complicates things. It was a watershed moment when we were able to remove this car chassis from the West Ravine, which was previously totally hidden by vines and other invasives. It was the first time we no longer had to worry about our neighbors considering our yard a dumping room. Progress in the chapel in the woods continues because of a number of very positive forces, including volunteers working year round on monthly work days, leadership support, including financial commitments from the congregation and brotherhood, physical labors from a landscaping company, uh, maintenance staff of the congregation and religious school kids. And we can, we've had grants and donations and technical assistance from the city natural resource manager, the cooperative extension agent, the state forester, and a landscape designer. With all these positives, we have accomplishments. We've cleared invasives, created test gardens, removed hazards, planted a wildflower garden, and terraced and planted one ravine. So, how did we decide and get permission to take these steps? You have to remember that when it comes to decision making, the Jews wrote the book. In Exodus, the Lord said, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. The old adage about having two Jews in a room with three opinions is very true in our case. There are many competing interests in terms of maintaining the physical plant and humanitarian projects. And I must say that when the choices are paying staff salaries and installing energy efficient lights in lieu of reducing erosion, or providing meals for homeless shelters, or helping register voters, or supporting a halfway house instead of trimming trees, the balance comes in favor of the latter needs. Also, we keep in mind that many of the chapel's maintenance dollars come from the Brotherhood's volunteer catering. Did you ever wonder how many meals have to be served to buy one native plant? On the downside, please note that there is a huge board endless meetings throughout the congregation with many subgroups and many pots of money. As a result, decisions become fragmented. For example, last fall, Stewart spent a great deal of time at the administrator's request, getting three bids from arborists on trees that need trimming. When the time came to approve the funds, leaders were not forthcoming. On another occasion, board members approved a very complex grant without de designating a source for the upfront money, suggesting only that God would provide. It took more than a month before the sisterhood kindly loaned us the upfront money that was repaid when the project was completed. Out of these experiences, two truths emerge. One, out of chaos comes opportunity. For example, although originally a subcommittee of the Brotherhood, today it's not clear whether the Chapel in the Woods Committee operates under the Brotherhood or the Board. Yet we have really great committee members who are knowledgeable environmentalists, and they work hours on the hard physical labor that's involved and the administrative tasks. Yet they refuse to attend meetings, most answer emails sporadically, and we've never been able to get them to focus on long-range planning. The second truth is that if you bring in grants and dedicated donations, you're more likely to gain board approval. Free stuff makes board members very happy, and the free stuff includes hundreds of, hundreds of native plants and trees. We have been blessed, thanks to support from Northern Virginia's conservation community, government officials, and religious school leaders and students. We work hard on outreach. 
We teach environmental science in classrooms as well as during outdoor work days specifically for the kids. We have articles in the monthly newsletter, a synagogue-wide listserv, and a new dedicated page on the synagogue site. We reach out to families. The Family Environment Day that was part of the Audubon grant was particularly successful with 100 attendees. These days, work continues slowly. Clearing invasives, building community, surprising and delighting folks with every visit. The chapel in the woods is a sacred space, a place for religious services, tree canopy, shelter and food for wildlife, solitude, playground, teaching, gardening, picnics, beauty, and community. Thank you. Nancy and Stuart, thank you both. That was delightful. And, and it was getting real there, right? Uh, the real things that we all uh, face when uh, tackling projects that require community. That was a lot of fun. And uh, thank you both. All right, we'll hear um, the next 10 minutes about um, St. Peter's in the Woods and uh, the work that they're doing with their creation care projects. Uh, Mary and Steve Wharton will speak from that particular group. I would like to thank the uh, other presenters. There's a lot of good data in there, a lot of, lot of, lot of helpful information. Our, our program is fairly new. So uh, we, we were listening with real ears. Yeah. Um, I, I, I um, became a master naturalist in 2017, and um, in 2017, I also was asked to be an Audubon ambassador, and so I've enjoyed that uh, very much, and so when Margaret asked me if I was interested in, or if my congregation was interested, I should say, you know, in, in doing um, um, a um, demonstration garden, demonstration pollinator garden specifically, um, you know, would we be interested? And, and Reverend Susan, um, who was our a minister at that point, um, said that, you know, that was sure, you know, and that we needed to find a place, you know, for it. And uh, um, anyway, uh, interestingly enough, uh, but, you know, it, it just sort of led to another, a, a whole bunch of other things. Our first, first project was the pollinator garden. And we put that in, the, in front of the church where everybody could see it, you know, and we were right in front of the parking lot. Um, my husband put in these flagstones around, you know, to border it. Um, but it kind of took on a life of its own. Um, over here, we have a, um, it, we had this sign here, you know, that was, was great. And, and somebody put in a, a box of, um, for native, for uh, mason bees. Um, the plants were absolutely lovely. Um, I had a number of people who were interested, um, you know, in, in so the whole idea of this was, you know, to get people enthusiastic about taking um, native plants and putting them in, in their yard. And uh, um, fortunately with Audubon, they, Audubon gave us a lot of materials, you know, so that people could um, identify plants that would, would uh, work in their yards, you know, with high, um, high sun, you know, low sun, you know, um, shade plants. And, uh, you know, it was, it was um, um, it, you know, it was really interesting. I mean, I had a number of people ask about, um, you know, what, what they could do in their yards. And, and uh, um, Reverend Susan allowed me to put in um, flyers and, um, you know, materials, you know, to help people in aiding, you know, um, you know, picking out the right kind of plants and where to put them. So anyway, um, I think we can go to the next slide. This is, this is kind of funny. We had, um, it was, it was great. This, this part of our, our thing, we were, you know, we were trying to get certified by Audubon and, you uh, uh, you know, we had a number of, of um, we had yellow swallowtails, monarch butterflies, um, ruby-throated hummingbirds, um, dragonfly species, or spiders, wolf spiders, bats, um, <laughs> blue-tailed skinks, and all of that. Uh, what was really fun was with the, when the, when the pollinator, pollinator garden was in full swing, we had butterflies and uh, skippers and um, we had the the um, hummingbirds which would fly in and out 
And my husband uh, bought this um, crazy little thing that the, that they stuck on the the window of the of the sec the office the secretary. Uh, the hummingbirds would come in, and, and uh, she, she would be maybe like you know just maybe a foot away from them, and, and uh, you know they would come in and feed. Uh, at this, uh, yeah, no, and, the, and the kids loved it too. So it was just one of those things, you know, it started out, you know, it was fun, it was a lot of love. And uh, it was interesting, we, uh, we actually assembled a team of people who were creation care people who helped us plant the garden. And we had people who weeded the garden and, uh, you know, gave us suggestions and, and uh, you know, we were very pleased about that. Um, we had one person, um, Tim Bond in our, in our um, church, uh, but he was a beekeeper, and so on our grounds we actually have a beekeeper keep, uh, beehive now, and so that so that was uh, that so so that's it's been really fun you know to get people you know because they come in with you know you have one idea, these people have other ideas, and so you know it's kind of nice to grab them and embrace them. Um, we are on seven acres of woods. Our our meditation is located located in the back of the church. Our meditation trail is, is in the back of the church. There is a stream down there. And there are a lot of am really amazing native plants. Um, you know, I picture, there's a picture of a gallium um, mayapple um, and then the ever-present um, Christmas fern too. Um, and then um, if you go to the next slide, um, I, I can show you one other thing. Next slide. Okay, great. Um, when, when, I, when I went um, in the winter, I went back and um, could you go backwards or maybe not? Anyway, uh, there, there, were, there were a couple of plants that were kind of interesting. Um, the one in the middle here, the plant that's right next to the um, um, paragraph here, other native plants found on the meditation trail. Um, this is a crane's fly orchid and, and uh, there are a number of them in our backyard um, at St. Peter's. The other, the other plant here is this is a partridge berry. And that one thing that was kind of unique about the partridge berry was it actually covered um, um, one of the retention pots, just totally the whole berm was covered in partridge berry. Wow. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, St. Peter's had, uh, the St. Peter's in the Woods is just aptly named because they have a lot of native plants, um, naturalized plants in there. Um, and uh, no, we're very blessed, you know, to have that. Um, anyway, next slide. Okay, um, interesting, and it's, this is kind of interesting how it just sort of fed on this. Um, you know, we had a pollinator garden and then um, we had other people who were very interested in um, uh, the birds, native birds. We had have um, three um, bird um, nests here um, intended for bluebirds. Um, on the, on the very left-hand side, you see, um, the, the, the box in the middle has this little uh, slide on the end where you can open it up and you can see, you know, the, the baby birds inside the nest. Um, yeah, we, you know, we, we're, we're very lucky to have, you know, these bluebirds in here and it didn't take them long to find the, the, uh, the bluebird boxes. Um, we also have a couple of people. We have one uh, woman, Stacy Remix from, from G, um, G, um, you who uh, uh, does bird counts and uh, she and Kathleen Keebler who's part of our creation care crew um, are uh, actually do bird counts on the property so anyway so it's so it's just one of those things that just goes on and on we have um, a team of our church who cut be do beautiful cut floral arrangements um, you know they um, are our flower gill uh, but outside the church, we have a, a couple of people, Kate Armstrong and, and my husband and myself and a few other people have actually um, planted pots outside the church, you know, um, colorful plants, um, you know, to make, you know, the uh, um, entrance of, to the church look inviting. Um, we not, all <laughs> not all native yet. <laughs> then, then this is. The, um, I, I saw one of the other groups had a Boy Scout uh, troop. Uh, we we um, embraced this lovely Boy Scout troop, and they did a great job. They created a labyrinth um, as part of this uh, um, young man's Eagle Scout project, um, and it's become kind of a, a very special place. You know, a, um, a meditation uh, path, the labyrinth um, is 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 a pathway for people to walk. Um, it's it's like you wind into the middle and then you start to to wind back out, 
and uh, you can say prayers, you know, you can meditate, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a relaxing thing to do, you know, to uh, follow the path of the meditation um, path. And, you know, we're, we're proud to have that, you know, as part of our, our church. Um, next, next uh, slide. Um, we also have um, a lovely memorial garden, um, which is outdoors. It has a polished and carved granite altar in its center. Um, it's um, uh, mostly shaded during the day, um, and, it, and, and uh, uh, we made good use of putting in some deep shade plants um, around the altar and right outside, um, you know, the area around, um, you know, the uh, meditation, the memorial garden, I'm sorry, memorial garden. Um, there are a number of benches over there. Um, we, we do, um, or at least we have done uh, two services, one in the spring and one in the fall. Um, to celebrate the outdoors, you know, of, of St. Peter's, you know, um, you know, um, woods um, and uh, and native uh, plant surroundings, and uh, the, and uh, it's a great place. A lot of people um, go and, and uh, sit around and in those benches there. Um, one of the things, the two things that I've added to, uh, actually, Steve and I added to this to the med, to the uh, memorial garden are uh, a little more Christmas fern, and then and we added the sedum ternatum, um, a native uh, sedum, um, and hopefully you know those will spread and, and uh, you know becomes anchors around you know the uh, memorial garden there. So next, um, I guess. Uh, lately, um, um, our, our, our rector has gotten a, a good deal of interest from several people in growing fresh food for food banks. Um, she's allowing um, our, some of our congregation members to create food plots behind our, our, our church for community gardens. So we're getting ready to start on that project. We have uh, two w women who um, are, are planning to uh, take this apart, this, this uh, garden apart and, and plant it and extend it. Um, so anyway, next, I guess. Gonna be a lot of beans starting yeah. this late. <laughs> This, this has been really great. Um, you know, I was really excited. I thought I, there were times when I felt like Steve and I were the lone soldiers in here. And uh, um, this is really great. Reverend Susan um, helped muster up this great team of people um, who I love to pieces. Um, Kate Armstrong, Chris Camillo, Renee Res uh, Costello, Patricia Keithley, who's been wonderful to me, Kathleen Keebler. Um, L. W. Leroy, um, Carol McLean, um, who's absolutely awesome and knows every plant in the world. Um, Stacy Remix, who is um, a bird specialist, and uh, Debbie uh, Sweetlick, who I just don't know what I would do without Debbie Sweetlick. Thank God for her. And um, you know, and then Linda, Linda Bellotti, our our um, best member. And I really do thank Reverend Susan, you know, for having um you know allowed us to do this you know um i i look at all of these other projects and you guys have been working on them for years and you're just all awesome um and and uh you know i swear you know we're, we're barely a little bit over two years into our project and um you know I, you know many thanks to all of you you know for 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 what you've done um we do truly do appreciate it we uh two places that we get most of our plants is our sangha and uh Nature by, by design in Alexandria. So those are those are really good resources if you're looking for plants that don't have nicotinoids and like that. Yeah. And I guess that's it. Wonderful. Oh, go ahead. Well, thank you. With that kind of enthusiasm, it's uh, wonderful to imagine where things will go in the next few years. <laughs> right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much progress and only two. Wonderful. Uh -huh. Our last panelist this afternoon, uh, before we go into our breakout groups, is Rebecca Mordini, who will tell us about the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. Rebecca? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me here. I am not going directly to screen share, so hopefully you're on speaker view and you can see me. Uh, I am the Outreach and Community Engagement Manager for the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions otherwise known as FACTS. And I am going to guess that a lot of you are already familiar with FACTS because I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of familiar uh, names of communities. But I want to make sure that you understand how we can help you with sustainable landscaping 
and what your other opportunities are to be uh, engaged with uh, facts and with other faith communities in Northern Virginia. So the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions unites people of faith to develop moral and equitable solutions to the climate crisis at the local level. You probably think of us best as uh, in our advocacy role, working with Fairfax County Board of Supervisors. And when you think about climate solutions, you think about reducing carbon, electric vehicles, solar panels. So, you know, where does, where does sustainable landscaping come into it? So what we've learned, I think, as uh, what everybody is learning in this time is that all of our crises and all of our solutions seem to be interconnected. And when you look at how we address climate change, it is definitely related to all the other sustainability and earth care measures that you're probably already doing in your church or faith community. So what are some of those things? Uh, flooding is a problem with climate change and you've seen how native plants and water retention can help uh, mitigate flooding. Your beautiful plants, remember Renee's, uh, Renee's graph with the plants and their roots and how the native plants have deeper roots. They're, pouring, they're pulling more carbon out of the air. Great carbon solution, sequestration. Uh, reduce energy use. So not a big fan of lawns here. I'll tell you a little about that. And so I love it to see when you change the native plants, you have less maintenance, less care, less energy, less chemicals ends up to have less carbon emissions. So it's a natural, it's a very natural uh, combination. That's why we're really happy to uh, help sponsor today. But also talking about sustainable landscaping is a very grounded way to bring people into the conversation about climate change. So, you know, maybe even in your own congregation, you have people who are very excited about plants and woods and connecting with nature, but how do you get them to pay attention to the very important crisis that we're facing around climate change? I think all these conversations that connect us with nature open a door to that next conversation. And then the third thing, and this is one of my favorite parts about being involved with FACTS, is that this sustainable landscaping and uh, workshops like this bring people of different faiths and different faith communities together. And what I'm always amazed of, about and energized with when I work with FACTS is how much we have in common, how we, our hearts and our passions really lead us in some of the same paths and directions. And, and that's so very important. And so that's some of the reasons that uh, FACTS is involved. I want to tell you a little bit, just so you, just as by way of introduction, why I'm involved. I was very, when Margaret told me about this, she said, oh yes, we're doing it. I didn't even ask my boss <laughs> because, uh, before I moved back to Virginia, I grew up here, but I lived in California and I worked for the Santa Barbara Botanic Garden, which is an all native plant botanical garden, obviously in Santa Barbara. And their mission is very much like the Plant Nova Natives mission, is to show people how you can use natives in landscaping to help get rid of lawns, to save uh, your resources and energy, and to create a market for native plants. So when I moved to Virginia, you guys should know, one of the first things I did was look for who are the native plant people, who are the, which I consider the cool people, and I got myself one of these. <laughs> so this is near and dear to my heart, and so it's really exciting to be here. So I'm gonna give you a little brief overview. As, as you know, we're all asked to speak a little bit about engagement, and I've loved hearing how the different communities have uh, engaged. And I'll just give a brief summary, which is pretty much what you've already heard. But what I found in working in my own congregation, the Mount Vernon uh, Unitarian Church, and with other congregations through FACTS are just a few key things. Uh, first of all, try to get your support from the top, from your pastor, your reverend, a minister. Uh, that They provide leadership for the community and they also have the pulpit to talk from, which is really powerful. Second, and these are not in any particular order. I'm just saying, second, link to your faith. What's important? What's in people's heart, spirit, spirit and uh, passion? Uh, and when I worked in marketing, we call that, you know, what is your why? 
And then what is your next why? You drill down to see why are you doing it? Why is it important that we get this done? It's not just another pretty thing. There's a why that goes deep. Uh, and then education. This is preparing your soil for the idea, right? Because I had to throw in a garden mentor. You knew it. Uh, so the more people know about the value of your project, teaching them about natives, about um, uh, all the different planting, the more, I mean, I'm always surprised that people don't know what I know. They don't know what you know. This isn't their life. So you need to make sure you prepare that ground. And a great way to do that, I'll mention it several times to give Margaret a boost, is there's a movie called Hometown Habitat. And you can, you can uh, show that at your congregation. And we did that, when we did that at MPUC, uh, we got a lot of interest. It really did help us. Uh, look to peer groups, uh, and this is where facts can come involved. What are the other, we look at what are the other Unitarian churches doing? What are the other churches doing in our uh, geographic region? And you can be inspired and, you know, get a little bit of friendly competition. Hey, my neighbor has a pollinator garden, why not me? Uh, allow for different levels of participation. I'm a big fan of brainstorming and bringing everybody in at the planning stage. And, you know, my team has to remind me that not everybody's comfortable there. A lot of people just want to know what day they show up to weed, right? And so you want to try to engage people at all different levels and provide that opportunity. Uh, and then what I heard a lot of and that I just really love is to reach out beyond the church walls. I've heard, you know, today, uh, whether it's getting volunteers from the community, from schools, the Eagle Scouts have been great. Uh, they built our compost bins at MVUC. Um, and, uh, and it includes the paid help, like Renee mentioned. You know, what you could pay somebody to do in two hours really could take you years to figure out on your own. I mean, it's totally worth it. And saving you mistakes and money along the way. And I think when you get that initial boost, people can see results early and then they have more buy-in as well. So that's a really a quick overview of fundamentals, I think, that everybody knows. I'll say something that I've begun to consider just in the past year is looking at my project, and my project is climate action and reversing climate change, which is very broad, but looking at your project, not asking the question, how can I get people to participate in my project, but how does my project give people an opportunity to work from their passions, to be heard, to be a part of something bigger than themselves, and to get the satisfaction of a project. And that requires that you listen more to people to see what their skills are and where their passions are. So there's more listening up front in your planning. Uh, and it requires a little flexibility. I know I, I think it was uh, Bethel uh, mentioned that you know, they didn't end up where they thought they were going, but where they ended up was great. And I think you need to be flexible for that, especially when you're working in, you know, large groups, especially when you keep in mind to love one another and to build our relationships with each other. And you always keep that front up front when you're doing planning. I think you can help get over some of the frustrations that you're definitely going to uh, come up across with bureaucracy and, and other things. All right, uh, very quickly, I, I do want to tell you a little bit more about the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions. And so now I am going to try to screen share. So let's see, and I'm gonna take you to not a uh, PowerPoint, but our website because there's gonna be a lot available for you here with or without me. And I want you to be able to find that. So uh, you can see we're at faithforclimate.org. And let me see. All right. So the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions, how do I join? I know you wanna join, it's fabulous. So you don't actually have to join. We are more of a participation network than something you join. So it's how you participate makes you a part of what we're doing. And there are plenty of ways to do that. Uh, first of all, 
Well, let me go on back up just a minute and tell you the two tracks that Fax works on, all right? Advocacy and direct action. Most people are well aware of our advocacy, uh, and it's at the local and state level. So we take all of our ideas and everything that we know, and we put power behind that in the government. There, you go. there we are with the Board of Supervisors. Uh, you can see that up on your screen. And we do that uh, through district models. So we have different a team that talks to each district. One of the big issues in advocacy, we've been uh, very successful getting LED lights, electric school buses, solar panels coming to over 100 county buildings. Uh, and at the state level, the Solar Freedom Bill, which is allowing us to expand solar everywhere. But for all of us tree lovers, I want to tell you that one of our main platforms is also about the tree canopy in uh, Fairfax County. And I saw that Cindy Spees is on the call and she is our, our issues lead on that and has been working very closely uh, with county uh, staff to put in our ideas to expand the tree canopy. And what might you be doing at your faith community? You may be expanding your own tree canopy. And we know that that is also a huge climate change solution as we take that solution global. So we're, it's, it is all connected. Uh, the other way that we are uh, engaged is through direct action. And that is being the change you want to see. And that is our work with individuals and faith communities. So our advocacy is Fairfax County, but our direct action is all of Northern Virginia. You do not have to be, and your church does not have to be located in Fairfax County. All right, so let's get you involved. First place to go, I, my gallery is in my way here, is over to our newsletter. And that is the best and easiest way to find out what we're doing and to get you involved. And I'm hoping that everybody who isn't already on the newsletter list signs up because what you're gonna get are advocacy updates, what FAX is doing, and what other faith communities are doing, provided you send the information to put in the newsletter about what you're doing. Another thing you can do is attend a workshop, and like this one, and we also have uh, FAX workshops that you can just call and get involved with. So you don't have to make up your own workshop uh, to do that. And uh, join an advocacy team. So we're back there on our homepage, and maybe it's not clear to you how you get into the advocacy. Where is that? That is right here in our Fairfax to Zero. Because that is our program for Fairfax County to get uh, Fairfax County to net zero by uh, 2050. So here's the campaign. Here's where you find out about your advocacy team. I'm just gonna click right there and more about Fairfax to Zero. Uh, so to do that, you email me. We will figure out your district and supervisor and connect you with that team for that district. And then you get invited to our monthly meetings where you get to hear the latest thing going on as far as all the advocacy efforts. And you're invited to join your team in meeting with your supervisor and your school board, uh, superintendent, uh, school board representative. Uh, so as I said, these are Fairfax County level teams, but if you are in Arlington or Alexandria, we are looking at expanding right now. We've been requested to expand in those areas. And on June 31st, there is a meeting to, uh, to expand in Arlington and Alexandria in this method. So please look that up on our website uh, to join. All right, so here's the fun thing that I wanna show you. Lastly is, how does your faith community get involved? Well, as an ex-fundraiser, I always like to say make a donation, but <laughs> that is not the only way. So the way we're pulling in faith communities right now is through our new Tree of Life program. Mm -hmm. And what this does is it awards faith communities who are involved a branch, a leaf, or a blossom for different actions that they take to reduce carbon and help the environment. Uh, so the leaves, basically, so you scroll down, you saw where you got to that in your programs. So you scroll down, you'll find out what's involved in it, how to join, great reasons to join, and the activities that get you leaves or blossoms. And you, you can see the different levels. And when you get enough of each, you end up getting the tree of life right here. You can see that. So here are some actions. Look, here are the leaves down here. And what's down with the leaves? Plant native plants. Love it. So you get a leaf for 
how will that work? So you get a leaf for education. So that's coming to this webinar or giving a webinar, showing hometown habitat. You get a blossom when you actually plant your pollinator garden or uh, uh, any of the other sustainability projects. When you click on this, this is where we're going to be keeping spotlights from what people you've heard about today. And as you work on your project, send me the information and we can add you on. And then you become a resource. And this is what we want to do, connect people. So you become a resource as to how you dealt with these different issues, just like we learned today. I have no idea how much time I have left. Uh, Joanne, where am I? So yeah, and I can't hear you. So <laughs> I can give you a little bit over. So okay, let me anything. wrap it up then. You can see what's available here, and uh, I'm not going to get a lot more on that. Um, and I, I am ready to wrap up. So why I'm going to stop my share. There's so many ways to get involved with climate action, and I just want to reiterate that the faith. What's important about the Faith Alliance for Climate Solutions is that the voice of people of faith is important and we can make that voice heard at policy levels and connect with each other, so thanks. Amen and thank you, uh, Rebecca. And your list of fundamentals will provide a very good and rich basis for which, um, on which some of the breakout group discussions can occur, so. Uh, while we give people just one last moment, uh, just reviewing some of those fundamentals that might be things people want to talk about when we break out. We had getting support from the top, um, understanding how to link to our faith, doing the education work that needs to be done, and um, allowing for different levels of participation and reaching out beyond. Those were all useful lessons, Rebecca, and we really appreciate it. We know that uh, the Mount Vernon Unitarians have been a very active congregation and our leaders in, in this work. So here we are back in our main breakout group, more or less at the time that we had agreed uh, we would be adjourning. So um, we, we thought we might spend just a few minutes uh, with quick summaries. Renee, do you have anything you'd like to bring from your breakout group? Well, we talked a lot about water issues and how to control that extra runoff or flooding. Uh, we also touched on bloom times. I posted a link to the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service Native Plants for Wildlife Habitat and Conservation Landscaping. I'll put that in the chat box and we'll get Margaret to add that in the follow-up email as well. Really great technical resource for things like that. Um, that was probably a, the, sh the short update on our, on our talk. Good. All right. Reports from the other breakout group groups, Margaret? Yes. Uh, we were in the plant, the native plant group, and four things that I jotted down. Uh, one was Bethel put up 66 concrete barriers and renamed them because they are concrete plant planters and filled them full of native plants. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, there is an excellent suggestion that, especially when you start right from when you're starting out, that at any time that you document for posterity the, what plants you put in and why for the poor volunteers that will follow you. And the suggestion about how to do that would be to use one of the many apps, uh, Plant Snap or Leaf Snap, or I suggest iNaturalist, and put in the comments section where you put the plant and why. Um, uh, UU of Arlington mentioned that they have remnants of woods, and rather than going out immediately and buying a lot of plants, they worked on removing the invasives and saw what grew back in naturally from the from the seed bank, and quite a few yeah, things exactly. did. And um, then the final thing was, um, if you're considering a rain garden, or seriously considering a rain garden, you might be able to get technical help from the Soil and Water Conservation District. Yeah, that's a good idea. Do a perk test and tell you where you can put it that will actually work. Great. Thank you. And Barbara? Yes. Um, well, we had a, a great discussion about different ways to engage people in enjoying um, uh, pollinator gardens, native gardens. 
And one of the first ones was a way to engage children um, as part of a practice of uh, knowing how valuable your uh, native landscape is, uh, is to note the, the species that you see um, that use it. So not the plant species this time, but the different wildlife. And so putting a list someplace where the children will uh, know what they have seen helps to get them engaged and I'm sure it gets the parents to stop and, and talk about it as well. Um, uh, we have people putting a, a parish a green tips section into the parish bulletin. And uh, along with that, a wonderful suggestion about starting a blog uh, that um, Margaret is doing. And that uh, goes out to people to let them know what's going on in the garden now. So if you stop by, what would you see blooming? Uh, what might be using it right now, and um, that really helps people get educated about it. Um, and the other suggestion that uh, came up was iconic species that are supported. So lots of people will have monarch gardens, um, but the uh, thought about supporting fireflies in the evening um, phase of the day uh, to really help people understand uh, how to do that. So setting the church uh, campus up to support fireflies and then letting people take that idea home. Thanks. Lovely. All right. And in our vegetable group, we were able to, um, we were able to advise, I think our long distance champ uh, attendee from North Carolina, Farrah Khan, uh, a little bit on uh, going to her soil and water conservation district, as well as the cooperative extension office for ideas about uh, grants to fund initiatives she's interested in. There were several people who were just getting started. Um, we also heard a, a, a lovely report on a second year uh, project at Nativity Catholic in Burke and heard a little bit about how they um, fund what they're doing and uh, are going about and all the, the people they've engaged. So uh, we reiterated things. Dave, anything I missed? I would just mention that uh, Audrey Mor Morris pointed out a good resource. Uh, the Friends of Urban Ag has a listing of uh, local food banks that um, um, are a good source uh, for providing fresh vegetables to over. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Does anyone have a last word uh, among our speakers before we um, send everyone off with a blessing? One thing that did not come up that might be uh, almost all of these churches have uh, master naturalists and so forth in them. Uh, Mary has led some flower walks up at uh, uh, the Thompson Wildlife Management Area. That's one of the areas that I, that I go to. Yeah, actually, Stacy Remix also does bird counts from up there too. And then, and then, uh, what's the one? Uh, the blue bells. Uh, the bluebells um, that is over there. Um, it's on, on the um, Great Falls. Great Falls. Area. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, River that's just. That, I mean, Riverbend. Yeah, River yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't take the whole army, but you can take you can take some of the more interested people, and they do like it. Yeah. So it's a very good point to always um, look in your congregation for sources of expertise, uh, as well as enthusiasm in in these things. Wonderful. Well, again, um, we are going to draw this to a conclusion. And uh, if you have um, questions that, that you didn't feel comfortable bringing to the whole group and you'd like to linger and loiter a little bit, we don't need to close the meeting off immediately. Uh, but I will close with um, a prayer from uh, Laudato Si, if I may, and invite everyone to join me. All-powerful God, you are present in the whole universe and in the smallest of your creatures. You embrace with your tenderness all that exists. Pour out upon us the power of your love that we may protect life and beauty. Fill us with peace that we may live as brothers and sisters, harming no one. O oh God of the poor, help us to rescue the abandoned and forgotten of this earth so precious in your eyes. Bring healing to our lives that we may protect the world and not prey on it. 
that we may sow beauty, not pollution and destruction. Touch the hearts of those who look only for gain at the expense of the poor and the earth. Teach us to discover the worth of each thing, to be filled with awe and contemplation, to recognize that we're profoundly united with every creature as we journey towards your infinite light. We thank you for being with us each day. Encourage us, we pray, in our work and struggle for justice, love, and peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.